Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 78. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And Ben. Hello. And then possibly Jeff joining us later, a new, I believe, uh, potentially first time being on the podcast. But we'll see if he gets our notification. Uh, (laughs) We four, me, Orion, Ben, and Jeff, have been playing 18xx games on 18xx.games, the online platform, for months now, since we are not able to meet in person uh, due to, for, for obvious reasons. We've been playing on this online platform, which has allowed us to dive into these 18xx games. We've been kind of slowly progressing through uh, different styles, different systems, and I figure it is time to return to this genre of game, part two. Of, of our 18xx podcast this time we're going to be comparing five different games against each other last time if you remember uh, which was amazingly two years ago i thought it was like eight months ago when we did this podcast uh, orion and i in our introduction to 18xx podcast uh, but it was in fact two years ago nearly two years ago Uh, We talked about 18xx kind of conceptually as an idea of a system of games. This one we're going to be looking at very specific games, how they differ, the different play experiences, that kind of thing. So let's get started. Actually, let's get started. I want to give a plug to this platform, 18xx.games. It is like 18xx games themselves, not pretty, kind of low frills, but exceptionally practical. They, it's they've fantastic. Done a, they've done a very good job with it. I, I'm I'm very pleased with how this system is working, how this platform's working. They seem to be introducing a new game like every week, it seems, or every other week. There's some new announcement of a game that came through, or that that's being developed. Would you put in alpha? I just saw that 1822 entered alpha or entered beta, uh, which I'm excited to learn since I've I've not played the original 1822. But, I mean, it, it works very, very well. Um, one of the better online board gaming platforms I think I've used. Yeah, it's really well done. There's a fun story about uh, Toby, the guy who kind of heads up the project because it's an open source co- um, collaborative thing. And there is some post on, like, the the GitHub for the old RR18XXRR or whatever the, that site is, or the Board18 site about why can't someone just make a site that works or something like that effect? (laughs) And then he went out and, you know, started 18xx games and there's a whole, you know, there's a bunch of people that help them. I I've dipped my toe into the dev channel in their Slack and um, they're constantly discussing games and how to implement things. And just from using the site, there's, there's new games and new features coming out constantly. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, the speed at which they're doing it. They just introduced uh, a system where you can set up auto pass mechanics so to, good. Make, to make the games go by faster if you just want to pass through something. Yeah. It, it's real nice, and I'm it's, enjoying it quite a bit. Thanks, you know, and it's free. Thank you to the developers there, and and to the publishers. I think all of the games on the site have gotten publisher and designer approval to be there. It's no yep. uh, no kind of pirate system of or underground or not really official no one's going to say anything reminds me of the old days with the isotropic site for dominion the good ah, old days it's like just go make it yeah we just want people to play our game yeah yep anyways we've been playing five specific 18xx games over the last few months uh just because we do you know we play one a few times get a little tired of it let's move on to something else we've gotten through five no particular reason to focus on five but that's what we've done and these five are in the order that we're roughly going to be talking about them 1846 18 mechs 1889 18 chesapeake and 1817 uh, which is quite an adventure i still have no idea what's going on with that one but let's start with 1846 uh, which is the first one i learned is it the first one we all learned it was my, uh, my yeah. first one. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and it is kind of the standard for many people, the introductory 18xx game. I understand why a lot of people detract from that and say it should not be the introductory 18xx game. 
it, it is a good introductory game because it is a lot softer. You're almost certainly not going to go bankrupt in it. Uh, it is a bad introductory game because there are a lot of rules exceptions that do not exist in other 18xx games. So I see the, I see the arguments on both sides. But I think it is an underrated 18xx game, and playing it online has solidified that opinion. I've played a lot of random games even outside of this group of 46, and I'm really discovering lots of new stuff about that game that I had not realized before. I wonder, is, is that your experiences also playing this a few more times online? I don't know that I experience new things. I enjoy playing it at a faster pace online and being able to restart the game and be like, well, this game blew up and I lost horribly. I'll try a new strategy. And there's not a lot of cost in terms of, well, we set aside a whole game, a day to play this game, and I, I'm i done by round two, and now I'm going to sit here for the next five hours and waiting for everyone else to finish the game. Um, yeah. Online, it just doesn't have that same cost. So we've been able to iterate through a number of games and a number of different strategies and see how they play. So I my opinion of the game is still mostly the same. I've enjoyed it, but yeah. I, I don't think... I've necessarily like I, I don't know the online play has made a difference in like the new ways I've experienced 1846. But I think the the biggest thing that it's done is it's taken away a lot of the inefficiencies of like having to calculate your route each time when you're doing it in person and like spending so long crunching the numbers where here it just gives it to you. Um and I think that's probably the biggest boon to me is you don't, you know, it it does all the hard work for you so you can focus on the strategy instead of the math. And that's not really 1846 specific. That's for all, all 18xx games, but it's made a huge difference. That and playing asynchronous when you don't have to wait for people to take their turns and you don't feel bad about taking two like three or four minutes to figure out what you're doing um <laughs> which i i i i greatly appreciate the fact that we we can take as long as we want to think on our turns yeah i mean the efficiency of the online platform is is really nice i will certainly not miss not having to calculate my routes when i return <laughs> to 18xx gaming in uh over the table in real life or in 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 physical space life i don't know what to call that meat space meat oh, that, that's the phrase meat space <laughs> that's right yeah uh calculating the routes is going to be a fresh experience again once we get back there but in terms of the game 46 I found, so initially I found that, you know, as everyone says, 1846 is about running a good company. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'll try to be efficient with my route building, get my tokens down, get the good routes, make sure I have enough money for trains. And then I realized, no, it's more than that. And that you'll, you'll do fine if you do that, but you're probably not going to win doing that. And then I thought, oh, well, the privates are actually a pretty big factor in 1846, especially compared yeah. to other 18xx games. And I believe that's true. Now, after a few more games, my thinking is that there's actually a lot in not only the private companies, but the initial company starting price that you set your first company at. Because I've seen people set it super low, get tons of shares early, and essentially use their first company as this kind of long, like slow suitcase uh, to get money. And their second company is really the one that they're trying to run the best. And I've seen that strategy work so much that I think there's a lot there in how you're going to focus your companies. Are you going to try to start a good company at first that's going to be able to last the whole game uh, in solid uh, status? Or are you going to try to get as much cash in your pocket 
as fast as possible at the beginning of the game. So in stock round two or three, you can start your second company and have that one ride you off until the end of the game uh, as your strongest company. So I think there's a lot more consideration there in terms of movement at the beginning. It's not just start a solid company, do your opening track lays and try to get good routes. Uh, there's more involvement there in the beginning of the of the 46 game uh, than I had previously thought. At least that's that's my thoughts on the strategy of the game at this time. I, I think one of the things that's unique about 1846 in comparison with a lot of the other games is that there are not enough companies for everyone to have two, um, at least at the player accounts that we've been playing at. And it's, it's okay. If you don't start a second company, I've in probably less than half, but more than a third of the games that I've played, uh, the person who wins only has one company. Uh, it's just cause they, made the right investment decisions um and they they didn't end up getting in fights with other people uh, and I, I, maybe it's just that they survived and kind of stayed out of the the pissing contests <laughs> but uh it it's really interesting to me cuz in almost every other game it feels like more companies equals more cash um, but I don't know that that's necessarily true in 1846. Yeah, it's, it's probably think, correlated, but it's not. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a there's a group of people I know who have played 46 hundreds of times. And I heard third hand. So I heard someone quoting them that uh, their thought is that half the time the person with two companies wins and half the time a person with one company wins, uh, which shows you the strength that you can have of just running one company. Although I think the common, like the, the everyday, like wisdom of people who haven't played hundreds of times is that people with two companies win almost every time. Hmm. I'm in a game right now in the middle of a game with some random people where I don't own any companies <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to win, but I think I have second place locked down. <laughs> uh, I had a very... I, I tried, I haven't quite gotten the handle on running IC. And so I parred them too high and couldn't afford to hold on to the company, but I ended up with, uh, with four shares. And I think I ended up buying a fifth. So I think me and the owner of the company both have five shares. And I just ended up investing in stronger companies that were, you know, just, just plain investor and I'm doing pretty well with it. So I think there's more nuance there than people think. And, and while I do, I, ha I have enjoyed stretching out and finding wilder, more unique systems. Uh, 46, I think, will continue to be kind of a, a bedrock 18xx for me. I think it has the most unique sense of each company where like each company has like the benefit and a de detraction um, where like you have an advantage to taking each company and then you have something you have to overcome. And I, I feel like there's, I mean, just based on board location, you have that in every game, but it feels more pronounced to me in 1846. That is true. Cause some, you know, the, like 1817, uh, there's not really any <laughs> company identity at all. The companies are essentially the, or they are literally the same except for their name. So, and you can start them anywhere. So yeah, 1846 does have a strong company identity. The next game we're going to talk about also does, I think, mechs. Whether or not you're starting in the southern or northern portion of the board is is really significant there. And yeah. I find mechs very, very fascinating on two fronts. So one is obviously the national company. And this is the only the only one of these that we're playing that we've played that we're going to talk about that has a national company. And it appears roughly at what the two thirds mark of the game, eh, maybe halfway through. Yeah. And the players can have a lot of influence over how strong that national company is. And in, if a multiple, you know, multiple players want to do it, they can make the national pretty weak. Uh, or if you kind of, don't worry about it. The national will end up being strong. So that's one of the interesting uh, new facets in that game. And then the other facet is that Mex has a very quick train rush. Like it, 
it packs a punch and it's really about trying to find a way to get your permanent train uh, which is distinct from 46 which has the softest train rush of many maybe any 18xx game although both of them are about getting good routes down and planning for the end game you just have to survive the train rush and figure out what you're going to do about the national in the process. So I, I find there is a connection between these two. I'm curious what you all think in the, the relationship between these two games. I see what you mean in the sense that uh, Mex is one of the only other games that has a soft rust option. So the fours get an extra, they, they obsolete instead of, you know, disappearing. Um, so that's a part of it. But like you mentioned, the first six, the second six, and then the 4D rusts the threes and the fours. <laughs> yeah. Or is it is it just those two? Is it just the two sixes? Maybe it's I just the two forget. sixes. It's, it, it's like two, it's like two or three trains yeah. rusts. It's, half it's but there's only like permanent. one copy of each of those. Like it's it's <laughs> yeah. real yeah. brisk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's there's a variant where you play the hard rust where the fours, you know, disappear immediately. Um, which we I don't think we ever tried, but um, yeah, I, I that think one that, I think is much more about bankrupts avoiding bankruptcy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the thing that killed me is, I think one of the games we played, the only time I got to run my four, it rusted. It's like I mm-hmm. bought it, someone bought a six or maybe a D or whatever, and like by the time my ne- next turn came around. The four was like one run and it was done. I, I it it felt like such a waste of money to buy the yeah. four, but someone has to do it. You know, that's, yeah, that, uh, that, that's that, such a cool aspect of eighteen XX games with any eighteen XX games is that you first the poison train. <laughs> well, you well, you first start thinking, I I want to buy trains in order to utilize the trains and get money off of them. And then you play some games and it's like, I want to buy these trains so that they go away <laughs> and we progress the game at a more rapid pace. So because it hurts everyone else more than it hurts me, even if I yeah. get to use this train one or even zero times, uh, there's mm-hmm. this like pushing the pace of the game aspect that gets really powerful in some games. And in mechs certainly can. I mean, it accelerates quite quickly into the the five and sixes. Uh, which is definitely a distinction. Uh, but again, the similarities between it and 46 is that I think that the companies do have this kind of distinct identity and yeah. the geography of the map does matter a decent amount. Yeah, I I like mechs a good bit. Um, I The thing that I haven't managed to do in a game yet is execute that, get the, get the mech or get the national and then plan out a, a, a company to merge into it and kind of, successfully do that um because what i found is if you run the national and people let you run the national and like get all six 60 percent of it you basically have won the game at that point and everyone else needs to take active steps to block or curtail or adjust the timing or something or buy up the national so that the president only gets you know four and a half shares instead of six or five and a half even um like that share and a half or so difference makes a huge difference in the game and we you get a lot of game theory there of you know i've run into a lot of that whatever the the fourth stock round when we um you know we hit the five the mix or the national merges in and starts and then i'm like (sighs) do I want to buy the national? It doesn't have any trains and it's going to go down a step. Uh, It is the best in terms of potential, but I kind of want to buy this other company that actually has trains and will pay out twice, but I can't let the president just own all of NDM. So I guess I buy Mex (laughs) or I I guess I buy the national. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting decision point. I think this game, a lot of other games are, more front loaded and i think this game is like middle loaded so you kind of start your train and the first two ors are just always the same they don't matter and then your your transition of like the end of the threes through the fours and then that train rush period like those two sets of ors or whatever that ends up being you know the the three prime through the six um determines the game i think as opposed to other 
games where getting ahead of it and getting in position ahead of time is more important. And I'm not going to say it's necessarily more important in this game, but I think it's more obvious in mechs Mm -hmm. more than any other 18xx game I've played that manipulating your position in turn order can be so important. Because that train rush hits, you do not want to get stuck with the poison pill, the last four. (laughs) And I've sold shares in my own company just to push it back in turn order so I don't get stuck with that train, which ended up not working out because I didn't predict correctly. uh, And I lost miserably that game. But I, I think I tried it one other time, but like trying to just, you know, buying and selling shares in order to get your company just in time to buy like the first five train uh, is really nice. We also have that weird game, Orion, where you were in a position, you like went infinite, essentially. Uh, one of our first games of, of 18xx because you were the only one who could buy a train and you just didn't. Oh, yeah. Everyone else was train locked and I got to, com- I had complete control over when we triggered the end game, basically. And I was able to set it up to be the you know most advantageous to myself. Or no, it was that I was running a bunch of non-permanent trains, but no one could buy the, the final permanent to rust everything. And so I was running like three extra four trains that I shouldn't have been running or something. Yeah. I remember that. I that had was, forgotten about that. That was that a was weird pretty, one. <laughs> that was that was cool. Oh, I felt so good about that game because I saw it coming and was able to like plan my share purchases around that situation. Because if you guys had acted, I think there was like one stock action where someone could have started the company ahead of me and controlled that extra, you know, train purchase slot essentially as like this hidden resource that you don't think about really of, you know, company train slots. And I was, I sold down this crappy company that looked like it was just headed for the dumpster. And you guys let me own it with two shares because you're like, well, it's just going to rust and you're going to be dead and bankrupt. But I was able to use that cash and start the other company that I needed to control the train rush. And I'm pretty sure I won that game because of it. Are you destroyed? I think you just held on until the bank. I don't think we ever hit the the diesels. Okay. Yeah. I, I forget you, how it ended. but yeah. I think you just held on because yeah. you were just gaining money on us every round. I think we ended yeah. up conceding. Like it was once it was okay. clear that you were gaining at a faster rate and uh, we could do nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. The other thing with mechs is that this is a game where you actually run out of the last train and it matters. Uh, yeah. A lot of yeah. other games, you know, like 30, you there's no way you run out of the D's. Like it's, if they're not infinite, then there's more than you'll be able to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the other systems similar to 30 have that sort of mechanic where, um, you know, the eight trains or the D trains or the, you know, whatever the last train is, is infinite. And in mechs, that last OR or set of ORs, people are aggressively withholding to get that second 4D train because it's the difference between running for 40 or running for 80. Like it's a huge difference. Yeah. And we almost in most of our games that go to the end, we run out of those. We buy all of them. And there's a company that would have liked another train and is stuck in, you know, left out in the cold and that person loses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've been on both cool sides dynamic. of that. I think. Yeah. It's a very yeah. cool dynamic that's unique to that game. And because most 18xx games, the idea is that the end game is pretty much scripted. You want to figure out who is who has won the game as fast as possible. So it kind of tries to exponential curve the end game and just blast it out uh, based mm-hmm. on the position that's that people are in like three quarters of the way through. But in mechs, you're kind of playing all the way through and getting to that position. I mean, a lot of it's kind of essentially autopilot. But that aspect of the game does uh, keep the interest up. And if I, the, I've, the, I've the, only played the, mechs once in real life, and I think Max is a relatively short 18xx game, I think, in terms uh, of playtime. Yeah. It's, it's on the shorter side. It's definitely like we, we've definitely played it on a weeknight pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's definitely a four hour game, not an eight hour game. Yeah. The other reason Max is more 
middle loaded is that you can only buy one train per OR for the first, you know, phase of the game. Oh, that's true. Which we didn't true. mention. Um, yeah, yeah. So the yellow, but you can't rush the yellow phase. The only way to rush the yellow phase is by starting more companies, which you you really can't do. You could. It, it depends a little bit on how the <laughs> how much you spend in the auction. Uh, but I don't think you can sell shares in the first round. So you can't like start a company, sell it, start another company or something weird like that to try to accelerate the game. Yeah. It's got a lot of nice touches like that. I really do enjoy mechs. I've, I've enjoyed it quite a bit. And I like the very geography and the train costs that force you into certain route patterns and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And I, I still don't know what, like in, in 46, there are pretty obvious good starting companies. Like New York is just good. It's always going to be good. Uh, or Erie, if if uh, you can make sure you get the jump on New York. IC is always solid to start with. Trunk is always solid to start with. In, I think really in anything Max, except for CNO. Well, in but I think I think you would almost always choose. For, well, maybe not. I think I would almost always choose, for instance, New York over Penn as a starting or company or Erie, right? Um, there, you'd need you need some extra circumstance to change your decision there. Yeah, B and O if you get the right private uh, can be good. Otherwise, it's not very good. C and O is just a non, just the weakest one. I C kind of if you get the right privates. Uh, so, I C is it like an early game powerhouse, but it fades if you don't get the right privates and setup. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You. you you have to get an east west route with IC. If you if you don't get an east west route, you're sunk. Yeah, I think you you need another token with IC. Yeah. Um, whether either in the form of one of the independent railroads or the Chicago CWI. Yeah, I would say you you almost need Michigan Southern um, specifically just because that gets you into Detroit. I um, love IC with Michigan Southern. I think that's a yeah, really it's a good, good combo. Sure. Yeah, that might Although be the, the downside is that you have you have less starting uh, money to try to par it a bit higher to get that extra subsidy money. It's a yeah, but it's worth but I, it. I think it's yeah. definitely worth it. Anyways, with Max, I don't even know what like almost every company, with the exception of like two, seem good to start on. Like both of the northern companies seem legit. The one that's like off to the, the the far southern one is the only like the clear weakest one. U UDY. UDY is terrible. UDY garbage. is just bad. Yeah. It's um, garbage. The blue one you is, can make is a kind of rough. <laughs> yeah, you can make a case SR. for a number of of the rest of them. Yeah, uh, as, I as think, good starting points. Good starting I, companies. I, yeah. I think Tex the, or the what was it? Texmex. Tex? Yeah, yeah, Texmex. <laughs> that that one seems to me to be like uh, it's not like. It's not like UDY bad, but it's 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 kind of like in the middle range where it's like, I'm not going to start yeah, it unless it, I have it, to. It's a mid-range company. Yeah. Um, I think but, the but clear winners for me were like... You have this interesting decision where the northern companies give you more tokens, but being able to control the route positioning around Mexico City yeah. uh, with the less tokened companies is so, can be so strong. Yeah. I think that's that's yeah that's why I yeah. think that the Mex company Mex is, is so good. <laughs> probably the best start because you just immediately get in Mexico City yeah. and you get to control the track and I think that company has three tokens whereas the the one on the north side the MR or MX only or whatever that is only has yeah. two the the whatever the black token company is mm -hmm. yeah and then you have the FCP and Cha which have four tokens but they start so so much farther away mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. There's lots of character in those companies. Let's shift over now to the, I mean, I'd say the more financially focused ones is, is I think, particularly 89, which is what many people consider to be the best starting point for 18xx. I might counter by saying I think Chesapeake might be a better starting game for 18xx. 89 is a more accurate kind of replication of 30s rules. I think it's basically the same rule set with a smaller map from what mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, I think Chesapeake has a more rounded view of 
like what 18xx games can bring so it's got a little bit more on the track lane tile uh positional stuff with all the financial stuff included uh what do you guys think about kind of an introductory 18xx game uh between these two or even you know if you want to make a case for 46 yeah i think i agree with you i i think chesapeake is i i like chesapeake more as a game and also as an introductory game i think 89 is fine and if it was you know if i hadn't played any of these other ones i would probably enjoy it a lot uh but i think it's definitely my least favorite of these five um it just it feels feels like all of the games kind of go the same. It's just different people playing the roles. And maybe that's just because I haven't played enough. But it was it was an interesting introduction to the world of full cap um <laughs> 18 XX games, which is my first full cap game that I played. But I I definitely like Chessie a lot more. I think it's the map is just more interesting to me. Yeah, I eighty similar in that I will say 89 is my least favorite of these five. But I think it's a better starting point just because it's more distilled 18xx. And there's like fewer ways you're going to get screwed. Like in Chessy, especially if you start the PRR company, there's like so many ways you can just mess up your initial track placement and you don't see it at the start. Mm. And I think you can get blocked more brutally in Chessy than you can in 89. And that yeah, that's probably interaction... True. I don't know. It maybe it depends on your personality, but that for that interaction, I think eighty nine is a better. Here's how you start a company. Here's how you float it. Here's how you make money running trains. Here's how you try to get to cities. Here's how you do all the eighteen xx things, uh, and then you move on to better versions of that. Setup. <laughs> <laughs> in, in in my view, not. I don't mean to besmirch eighty nine, but I like most other games better than it. So. Yeah, I think I'll third. It's my least favorite of the five we're going to talk about today. Although I would certainly uh, not turn down a game of it for sure. I, I'd still play it, and I, and I think there's a lot we haven't tapped into in terms of the nuances there. Uh, I think you you can really, if you get people really dedicated, you can rush out that game way faster than we have, or than we did when we played it. Uh, but I do agree, it is. I don't know. It's comparatively a bit benign i guess i don't i like map stuff that that's basically it like 89 the map ends up looking pretty much the same the the only real jockeying is over that how and when you get to that hub in the northeast uh that has like two of the the best city or something yeah Yeah, it has like the best city and one of the best off board uh places right next to it yeah, and uh, there's some cool jockeying you can do there in trying to do you start a company there. Eighty nine certainly one where your second company, in terms of like getting revenue, is going to be better than your first company. The first company is just to kind of progress the game and get past the yellow trains and and all that all that good stuff. But yeah, it is more distilled. I do like the case that you make, Orion, for that being the better introductory game in Chesapeake those two town tiles can really ruin you in particular <laughs> since there's only one copy of each one uh yeah. and uh they they touch on some of the two of the strongest off or the two strongest offboard regions have to go or almost have to go through one of those tiles yeah there's i, I guess there is more track blocking in that way which could rub someone the wrong way if uh, you introduce them with that game. But let's talk about these aside from them being an introductory or potentially introductory game. I do think 89 is interesting in in how the map almost doesn't matter as much. Like some companies it's, I think like if you it's, if as long as you get entrance and at least touch one of those places in the northeast, you're pretty good. Otherwise, you're probably not going to be able to run a diesel that loops around the entire island unless everyone else is severely messed up. <laughs> and uh, you just try to hit one of those, you know, get a good chunk of the island for your diesel in terms of trying to get track and like board position. A lot of the rest think, is, is financials. I think my favorite part of 89 is trying to 
designed the most absurd diesel route to hit everything <laughs> on the island. Um, and how you can like, how you set up like crossing track to loop in and, you know, do a swirl all the way around to hit, you know, the two best off boards and the three best cities and whatever else you can pick up along the way. Or like some weird figure eight thing. I've yeah, seen yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. Crazy things like that. Um, so I think that's kind of fun, but it doesn't hold my attention. And I think seeing how, even though you kind of end up in a similar spot, see in the order in which you start companies makes the route or the journey to that kind of similar endpoint very different. And like, what, how, or when do you build out the Northeast and when do you build out that, that Western loop? And, you know, do you bother starting that Eastern company and trying to get it in or does it get blocked and have to spend three ORs going around or something like that? I think those are the kind of the interesting parts. And then, you know, there's the picking a private, trying to pair a private with your starting company to have a, you know, a jump start over the other players. Another point I've heard in 1889's favor as an introductory game is that it demonstrates how you don't need to start a company in the first stock round. Because it's actually kind of hard to do in that game. Like in a four player game, maybe two people will, be starting companies in the first stock round and otherwise you can hold on to some really nice private companies that give you better revenue in mm-hmm. in those first uh couple ors that's the one is, with the ferry that pays you like 30 and then 50 or something yeah if you if you hold on to it it doesn't hold on to it yeah would the other companies die it gives you 50 around and costs what 200 or something at the beginning yeah uh, which is which is a cool thing to learn because uh i I'd, I'd forgotten about that <laughs> Uh, when we started playing 89, I'm like, oh, yeah, some of these privates, uh, the dividends they play are, are quite good. But, yeah, 89 is interesting. Chesapeake, I do think, is a lot of fun. In fact, I think it's, of the five, maybe it's my favorite right now. Really? Nice. Like, I think it's surpassed 46 in max. It's definitely better than 89. 17 has a lot of potential. I just haven't played it enough. Uh, it's between it's between Chesapeake and 46 for me, and I'm really having fun with it. I think it's got a really – it feels extremely balanced between operational stuff and financial stuff. The map I find very interesting, the short-term versus long-term considerations of what do you have to do to stay relevant in the game versus trying to set yourself up for those big endgame diesel runs. I think there all there's different uh, uh, characteristics of each of the companies. Um, I think the private auction's pretty interesting. There's some interesting privates there. I don't know. I think it's very well rounded eighteen XX game. That's that's my quick summary. I think it's probably the best thirty clone, and not that it's a ad- direct clone, but it's a lot more similar to thirty than anything else other than eighty nine. Yeah, and, and Orion, how I've only played thirty once. Have you played it more times? I've played it a handful of times. Yeah. Um, how does it compare to eighty nine and Chesapeake? Because obviously, they're obviously derived from it. In terms of your enjoyment of thirty, how does that compare to these two games? Um, I like thirty more than eighty nine. I think the map is more interesting, and the companies are more varied or not just more varied but the experience of playing a certain company will change game to game whereas that is not so much the case in 89 the most interesting part of 30 to me is how different it is at different player counts so Mm. 30 at four is very much a start a company get your routes you know get your capital, you move your capital around, start a second company and run your trains out. 30 at six is like this mad scramble to like stay on top of the sinking piece of door or whatever and like wait for someone else to go bankrupt before you because no one starts with enough or maybe like one, whoever gets the, you you can maybe float PRR, but I think no one has enough money to float a company on their own in the first round of a six player 30 game. And so it's this crazy, it's just, it's insane because you, you it forces you to start a company with someone else 
and then you're both trying to backstab each other <laughs> and uh and someone will almost certainly go bankrupt um which it's just a very different game and it's it's very interesting for that reason to me huh is there a preferred player count among aficionados for 30 i think most people say it's best at four or five probably five okay but we four should, and five we should, are similar uh, we should try to play a big a big game of that once i would i would be interested to see what that's like i would love to play 30 with people who haven't played it dozens of times because there's lots of i mean obviously it's like the og i mean it wasn't the first one but it is it is the far it's the OG by far the most influential one in the most popular one there was there was one game where george and i were floating the nynh which is the best early game company we had kind of agreed like all right let's float this company together and then it got to a situation where i didn't get to buy enough of the company or something like that. And so I dumped all of it and took over <laughs> B&O uh, from Jonas, who had the private but didn't want to start it. And then he dumped his two shares of B&O and bought something else. And then, so like three people swapped companies in the first <laughs> OR. Uh, it was just, it was madness. Uh, it was a lot of fun. That's super fun. But, but I, I know there's lots of like, conventional wisdom and kind of oh yeah route like you hu- can you can go you can go read a guide and someone know. will tell you yeah. someone will tell you this is the right way or this is how much you should bid for this private and this is what this com- this company should do on the first round and and so on yeah um, I, w- I would love to play 30 with people who do not know that information only <laughs> and would not want to play 30 with people who do know that information just because I hate feeling that far behind yeah. in my knowledge of the game. I feel like I'm just ruining the experience for everyone. Uh, but if this group wants to jump in, is, is 30 on 18 games? Uh, in beta. It's, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. in beta. Okay. They so started maybe, it recently. Maybe we uh, jump into that at some point. Just one other thing I'll say on 30 is that generally your routes suck. And it's not until very late in the game that you have a route that's worth anything. That's so it's, interesting. Yeah. So in some of these other games, like um, mechs, the first couple of rounds, kind of you're not really running for much. And then you get some really big runs later in the game. And uh, Chessy has a little bit of that, that 30-ish like bad runs for the first, you know, maybe two ORs or something. And then I think you, you can start to pick up with the better off boards and picking up the towns and upgrading cities and whatever else. But yeah. So I find Chessy interesting because it drags me in different directions. Like I, I, I have yet to mentally make the connection of like, I want to do this company with this private, but I actually need that private to do the thing I wanted to do. And there's just, I feel like I'm that tension in the early between uh, the initial stock round of trying to pair up i find it really difficult to pair a private with a company that it actually does something for or is optimal for and so i'm it's one of those like you you know name three things you can have two of them and i'm always trying to make the best of a flawed situation in that game yeah i think chespeak has also in, an interesting decision point of which companies you start so there's like the companies in the northeast are typically or mostly have fewer tokens and they're a bit well uh, they can be a bit further away from was it DC's the big town yeah the big city um but they get to control the early game playing of those critical routes in the northeast and, and the how those towns. cities connect in the double town <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I, can be so important. Yeah, I really only think LV is worth starting of the three because the other two are on river tiles and they don't have easy access to New York. Whereas like LV, you can just lay one track and you're there. Um, yeah, it's good. I don't know. I, I think, what is it? The the What's the green one? Pen? Yeah, PR. Pen is yeah, pen. I think more that one's the, also good. Yeah, but it's, that it's one more is, north. That one center. is really good. It's the center, but that initial, the way those gray 
uh, preset tiles go. Yeah. Like the way you lay your straight city can completely ruin the company if you don't do it right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think those two companies are very interesting early game. B and O is obviously Pen is four tokens too, which is Pen is four tokens, which is big. Yeah. Was it B and O is the one that gets easiest access to DC, but it yeah, tends it to be with a share. It, it tends to be slow going. I find it tends to be slow in the early game. Well, DC is like the, the only place you can get to. Yeah, yeah. It's that's the company where you have a better start than anyone, but then you have trouble getting out and building a bigger network because everyone else builds into DC mm-hmm, yeah. and kind of tokens as they go. And you have to kind of wait for green or orange to get through those Mm -hmm. tiles uh, before you can go (laughs) anywhere, really. And Uh, then I find I find getting one of the two southern companies can be pretty good. But they again, they're kind of slow. If if you start them in the right if you start it in the right order. Yes. Great. If you start them, if you start the one that goes second. You just you're done. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But you can't. Yeah. You don't want to uh, be going last in initiative between the two because yeah. you may get you, you need to get to that town before the other person does yes yeah uh which is which is interesting and i find the, the company on the west is just not very good is that the the pittsburgh one pittsburgh, PLE. yeah 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 ple i think you have to start it at the beginning of the game because it's so far away otherwise it'll just never get anywhere uh, yeah i i'm playing my second game with my other 18xx group of friends and i just started that one uh as my first company so we'll see how it goes wait ben you're saying you have other friends what is this i I have other 18xx friends what can i say (laughs) the one thing that always annoys me about that game is that the Ohio off board in the Middle West goes up to I think 100, 100 at the yeah. end, and the Northwest Pittsburgh one goes to 80 plus a town. So it's worth less to go there, even though you have an extra town because the off board is you know 20 difference. Yeah, it's a yeah. bit awkward, um, and it just I don't know why that ju- that just bothers me. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I but really anyways. I really enjoy Chesapeake. I really do. I heard some I heard some people really dislike it, and I and I did, I wasn't able to figure out why. I don't know. Ah. I think it has a bad reputation among a minority of eighteen XX folks, and I don't remember or didn't read why that was. I'd be curious to hear if anyone really dislikes this game. What the reasoning is, because I think it's a very again well rounded, pleasant. 18xx but that still has teeth like it's still you could go bankrupt you could make critical critical errors um and there's so many different dynamics going on that i i find it quite enjoyable i think i find it is still a little too 30 ish which i just like the vanilla 30 obviously it's an amazing game but i it's like vanilla sudoku it's an amazing it's a great puzzle but i like sudoku with variants you know i like extra things going on and so i like in the same way i like 18xx games that have something else going on i mean i agree yeah but of the of the 30 like very close 30 30 variants i I think think it's my favorite yeah i would probably agree but within 18xx it's middle of the pack for me in terms Mm -hmm. of my rankings well, uh, let's shift then to some banana zone. Uh, Something 18X. with a little more going on. <laughs> Something with a little spice to it, a little kick. Uh, let's talk about 1817. So Orion has played it more than we have. We are currently in our third, second or third? Second game. Second game of it. It is my second game. Yeah, I haven't yeah. played outside of, of this group. Our second game of it, it has, I think, an interesting map. Uh, but more critically, has both short selling and loans, which make it a completely different beast. Completely different beast. Uh, yeah. So the companies can take loans. The players can short sell other companies. It it, I, it I, also has the company sizes and merging, which is unique oh, among yes. these five games, which is yes. very significant. So yeah, you can have two share companies. Uh, or two cert companies, five cert companies, and ten full ten like normal company ma- major companies in an eighteen XX game. They can merge uh, to form larger companies, combine larger companies, 
which I always think is fun. I enjoyed that about uh, 62. And does 22 CA have merge? It doesn't have merging. It is upgrading, right? It Well, 22 CA has like the 50 minor companies that you buy into major companies. So oh, that's right. They it kind has, of purchase them, yeah. It's it's kind of buying in or merging in these real railroads. It's like a bunch of railroads that, you know, Michigan Southern or um Big 4 in in uh 80, in 46. It, they're kind of like that but a little bit more powerful and mm-hmm. more varied and then you kind of merge them into one monolith company. 41 has a bunch of merging, but um, we're, we're not really talking about that one. So. Oh, I played that one once. That's the Italy one, right? Yeah, Northern Italy. I found that one fun. I would like to play that one more. Anyways, 17. For me, it's a big, confusing, glorious mess. Orion, I want to hear your enthusiasm for it. Sell us on it. <laughs> uh, I love this game because I think there's a ton of complexity going on. And there's a lot of different moves you can make. And there's a lot of ways to get money in and out of companies besides paying dividends or, or, you know, floating, (laughs) which I find to be the biggest point where I get bored in, say, a 30 clone of the only ways to get money into the company after the initial auction are basically withhold or have shares in the market that you pay out into. And so I like alternate ways of getting money into companies and moving your capital around and finding the right way to utilize it to get an advantage at the right time. And so that sort of combination of complexity and strategic moves and tactical financial shenanigans makes this game just so much fun to me. This is off topic, but I appreciate the fact that in the auto tab in in 18xx website, it uses the word shenanigans when it's talking about protecting you from shenanigans. (laughs) And they've they've put measures in place to anti shenanigans measures. Um, yeah. it, it, is, it is the technical <laughs> term. If I if I were to try to boil down the strategy of seventeen into a few sentences, I would say it's about figuring out how to navigate your company merging and getting and the transition from four trains to permanent trains without getting too far without getting too buried in debt <laughs> of one kind of or another. Debt, yeah, the, the loans. That that was that one really got, got you guys, oh. yeah, yeah. Because uh, you you in the end of the last game, you guys were going hog wild with the loans to get up to the big permanent trains, and uh, then you realize, oh wait, I have to pay out two hundred in loan interest every <laughs> OR. That's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's got the fun kind of collective interest rate thing where mm-hmm. the yeah. more oh, man, I like everyone takes yeah. loans the greater the interest of each individual loan yeah. uh which is uh it's it's a trap it's 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 very martin wallace-esque uh which is except a good thing. except like game theory collective instead of you individually per- pushing and trying to yeah it's like another step it. yeah it's another another step uh deeper um, I'm curious your experience with the short selling in this game, because I think theoretically it's super, super fascinating. It seems, is it true that the real value to short selling in this game is if you can get other people on your side and just just destroy a company? Or is there are there situations where you can like tactically short a company here and short a company there for like a... A by quick, yourself a quick small uh net gain or is that not really a thing that happens yes to both of those i think you can shorting a company can absolutely be a way to attack another person's company uh it can also be a move where you notice a company say oh that company you know paid out full twice and repaid loans and is overvalued relative to their train and board situation. And so I will gain value by shorting that company and putting the capital into something else that will be more, that will more efficiently generate money for me. Yeah. Even after accounting for the interest or whatever that you have to pay on that short. Um, 
And also, if you make a bad short, like you found out in the first game, Mark, it can just <laughs> ruin you. Oh, yeah. Um, because, again, it's like the loan thing, but if you don't foresee how the next OR set of ORs is going to go, you can take that short and be like, hey, 120 bucks, sweet, let's go. But if that next, if that set of trains doesn't rust when you think it's going to rust and they manage to, you know, take a loan, buy up a bunch of shares and be paying out for effectively like 150% because you can own, the company owns those extra shortage shares, you can really get buried by that. Yeah. Um, so I like that it's this double-edged game knowledge, figuring out the situation as you go. And I, and I think the loans are flexible or sorry, shorts are flexible in there are multiple ways of using them. And there are plenty of times where it is wrong to short. I would say for, for myself, I don't think I would short anything other than a 10 share company unless it was like clearly, you know, DOA. Because pay, having to pay out 20% per short is not worth it. I, I agree in general. And I agree in general. And my rule of thumb is that I'm generally not looking to short five share companies unless yeah. it's an obvious deal. Yeah. Um, if it's like, like 200 or 250, their trains are all going to expire. Go for it. But Right. Well, I, I have another yeah. game. Well, it's 18 USA, which is a variant of... It's like another layer of stuff built on top of 1817. <laughs> um, but in that one, there was a five share company that it was up to like 285 or something. And the it had three trains, but two of them were going to rust if we shorted it down below all the new companies. And so we shorted, we all decided, well, it's worth, even if we, <laughs> if we all short it five times and force it down below the 200, the new 200 share price companies, those, the new, the six will come out, those threes will rust and we'll only have to pay out, you know, 40 bucks instead of a yeah. hundred. I think the, the caveat to what you said about being hesitant to short, and I'm not a master on this. I've only played this game like three times outside of this group. Um, but I know there are players who are much more aggressive with shorts and will use it to force a company down and force a company to either lose a bunch of share value or take a bunch of loans and get behind on the capital and train rush situation, which I think it kind of happened in that first game, Ben, where you, I was shorting BNA or yeah, BA to get it down below my share price so that I could run all my companies. Yeah, I and remember And you that. spent a ton of capital buying those shares back in. And it forced me to short it six times instead of three, but you had no money in that company and you had to spend a whole OR. I mean, you ended up getting two trains in the company by leveraging your other companies, but you had to take a ton of loan, ton of loans to do it. Yeah. And so my thinking in that situation was, if I can force your share price down at any cost, I can rust all the three trains and you will either have to abandon one of your companies or take a crippling number of loans. And you took a crippling number of loans and I made up like $2,000 of value in the next set of ORs yeah. because you, huge. because I was paying out four or I was paying out with five permanent trains and you were running like two permanent trains and a four that you had to half pay or something like that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the potential with this game, I mean, maybe people who are listening are hearing all of this and being like, wow, that sounds like a nightmare uh, from which there is no escape. And I'm running away now. All of this seems so refreshing and so cool in how much it adds to 18xx like it doesn't seem like it's just like doing it for the sake of it the idea of short selling in 18xx has so much potential and because i'm just starting to see especially i don't know how to do it but i understand like what really really good 18xx players do in a typical 18xx game so a typical 30 clone uh, or or 30 I understand what the big, like, dominant strategies are. And I've talked about this before, this idea of, like, seeing the boundary of the game, 
seen like the strategic wall of like, okay, that's like, I understand conceptually how far this game goes into like craziness in terms of what top tier strategy is. And once I see that and recognize it or learn about it, games lose a bit of luster for me just a little bit and it's subtle and I can, uh, you know, I can, I can, I can still love games. Like I still love, you know, something like twilight struggle, even though I understand, you know, this, the, the border there. And it's like memorizing all the cards and understanding all these really complex interactions and, in you know, being able to calculate your risk uh, uh, to a super fine point in many different decision points in that game. Um, and I can see that even though I, I certainly can't do it. In 1817, I have no idea where the borders are. Like, absolutely no idea. And I don't know if anyone's figured it out. Like, it's I don't think it's a relatively old... I don't, I don't think it's particularly old, is it? It's relatively new as far as 18xx games Within go, what, think. like the last five years? Last uh, eight years, I mean? Or we can look something. this up. We have I think it's within the last decade. You know, I don't think it's a 15, 18-year-old game, so... It is maybe. okay. It's it's eleven years old. It's 20, 2010. I mean, maybe people, maybe there's like expert pros and they've kind of figured out the game. But I mean, there are people that have me, played the game a hundred times. But yeah, but I don't know if they've even like figured stuff sure. out. Like I mean, there's vast, there's a lot of complexity, swaths of territory potentially for them. Maybe I don't know. Uh, but for me, from my perspective, it's just like this wild frontier of so much potentially fascinating strategic ground uh that uh this game excites me more than many many games i've played in re- even the last couple of years this this one's really gotten me excited <laughs> i'm really glad you guys like it because i love this game and i want to play it with people um, oh yeah, yeah. So i i definitely want to play this game a lot yeah <laughs> and uh i mean even just basic stuff like i in the first game i i almost went bankrupt it was very close and <laughs> yeah I, I, I kind of you had like away. one share left at the end, right? I was sitting on on one solid. I ended up with a profit. Okay, I ended up with more <laughs> money than I started the game with. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, there you according go. According to Galaxy Trucker rules, I won the game. <laughs> some people just won more than me, and by some people, I mean everyone else. Uh, <laughs> by orders of magnitude. Uh, but uh, even then, I realized, you know, I was looking at the idea of short selling wrong. I was looking at the companies that were in a bad situation, like they'd taken lots of loans already, and uh, they didn't have much capital, and their trains were about to rust. Uh, I didn't take into consideration they can just uh, upgrade that company to a better company, and then or a bigger company, and then take more loans and get out of it. In this game, also, I'm, I've, this is, I've done a couple of like tactical shorts on companies that I think will be taking loans the next set of ORs, uh, and I think that's a safe, safer move, is trying to predict, okay, this company has one loan, but they, they're definitely going to be taking at least two or three to get their next train purchase. Uh, that means they're going to move down in value by two or three steps, and the, now I know my short's probably going to be at least break even, and it gives me more flexibility. Uh, so just learning these little things has been very enjoyable. I, I think break even shorts are like high value un- money, baby. Yeah, right. I mean, it, I mean, it gives you so much right? more flexibility. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's you know not all your shorts have to be these things that'll make you like a hundred dollars per short, like the ones that we probably are going to have <laughs> this round with the yeah. Ryan's company. <laughs> you know, it, the the value of getting that the the money now as opposed to later is is important too Mm -hmm. yeah yeah because it's not necessarily even if you end up losing money on the short if you ended up gaining more money with the share you bought from that short it's an it's still profit yeah i mean it's basically just like taking a loan on your company yeah right it's just a fancy loan with unlimited a hundred dollars now with near unlimited downside (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as certain hedge funds just hedge like fund, shorting in the real market <laughs> hedge fund investors found out in the last few months uh shorting's <laughs> dangerous game yeah. stop uh but yeah 1817 is is a vast frontier of uh fun game and uh yeah it's nice i, I i'm really excited i hope it doesn't disappoint me in the end but uh so far, after one and a half plays, I still have no clue what's going on or what to do. <laughs> so, 
Well, if you get bored of this one, we can go to 18 USA that has 30 privates oh, and shit. like 30 or That's... a bunch of random city bonuses at the start. Ooh. And the off boards all shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> the off board values all shuffle. <laughs> oh, man. I, I think one of like the low key interesting things about 1817 is that you can start any company anywhere. Like, you the ability just, starting city yeah right yeah the ability just to drop a token on a city that you want to start from seems like incredibly powerful after playing mm-hmm. so much of the other 18 xx's yeah it's it's a cool i mean i don't think one one system is strictly better than the other but it is a uh, i'm glad that it exists as yeah. a way to well, start companies. i'm having to rethink all my strategies because i'm like oh well i'm gonna build you know i'm gonna take this company and i'm gonna token here but that might not be there anymore by the time i get around to it the token may spring up from somebody the earth. else i know it's it's really it's frustrating sometimes coming from other 18xx's trying to trying to plan for this one so the it's a good thing, kind of frustrating yeah the other thing that you can really make plans around is because you have those merge conversion acquisition rounds in the middle of the OR, you have this other time point where you can change a company situation and inject capital in the middle of the OR, um, which I think allows a lot of strategic changes or you know strategy to play off of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I think this was a really interesting comparison of these different games. I mean, even within this one overarching system, you have so much variation and so many different uh, nuances in, 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 in subsystems and emphases in this wide world of 18xx games, which even is like a sub-sub genre of games. There's like train games, but there's different genres of train game. Like it's such a niche, but it seems to be taking off. Like it seems to be for a system that's like 40 something years old. Uh, the last couple of years, I think have seen a big increase in the number of people playing 18xx games and that's exciting i mean there's some of the best games out there the best games ever made are are 18xx games and i've only i mean relatively speaking i've only played a couple like i've i, I think i've played maybe close to 10 but i mean there are so many there there they're like 15 ish being made every year now um and uh, i probably most of those are worth trying out uh, there's there's lots of enthusiasm in this little world. So if you're listening and you've made it this far without uh, any knowledge of 18xx before, first of all, bravo. Kudos to you. <laughs> uh, we didn't like explain anything. Uh, <laughs> I should have maybe told people at the beginning. You can listen to our previous 18xx podcast <laughs> if you want post. to. <laughs> If you want to learn something about the system first, because uh, this was all inside baseball. Uh, but secondly, you should try out an 18xx game. Find your 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 local uh, weirdo friend who plays these games obsessively. Uh, if you're in the board game world, you probably know someone, or at least know someone who knows someone. And uh, they'll probably be happy to teach you one of these games over at 18xx.games or uh, soon in real life in, in, in the meat space over the table. So with that, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, this was a very fun podcast. Thanks, Ben and Orion, for hopping on Zoom here and uh, discussing these wonderful games with me. If you would like to learn more about The Thoughtful Gamer, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you would like to follow me on social media, I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. And I just realized I have been neglecting to put on the please rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts spiel in the last few podcasts. And I don't know why I eliminated that thing. So please rate and review the podcast. Uh, maybe people have been. I haven't actually looked up the ratings. The last time I checked, which was probably like a year ago, we, I believe, still had a five-star rating on iTunes. So hopefully that still exists. And maybe I've been review-bombed and I don't even know it. But every time I try to open up iTunes, it wants me to, to log in and I have no clue what my login is. And I really don't want iTunes to know that information. Anyways, none of you need to know this. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.